Okay, well, let's get started. Good, mo good morning. Good afternoon, guys. Thank you for coming. Um, as you know, this is the Illuminating Legends panel that we're going to talk about um, graphic novel biographies and comic book biographies. And I thought it would make sense to start by having each of you guys introduce yourselves and also your books that were sp your biography books. So I have some slides. Um, Jeremy, why don't you start here? Um, hi, I'm uh, Jeremy uh, Royer. Uh, my book, Audubon and the Wing of the World at uh, Nobro. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> uh, Ron. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is Ronald Wimberly. Um, I did Sentences, The Life of M.F. Grimm. It's about uh, Percy Carey, so MC. Yeah. And I also did Black History in Its Own Words, which is, I guess that counts. I don't know if that counts. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Max. Yeah. Hi, uh, so my name is Max de Radiguez. I'm a Belgian cartoonist. And um, the, the book I'm here to talk about is uh, a book I did on Ouija. Um, usually I draw and write my stuff, but here I'm only the writer for the book. And, yep. Yeah. Hi, my name's Hazel Nulevant. My pronouns are they, them. And I have done a bunch of biographical short stories, If This Be Sin has biographical stories about um, Gladys Bentley and Wendy and Lisa from Prince's band, The Revolution. And I also did a biographical mini comic about the Portland activist Kathleen Sadat as part of this Comics for Change box set. Great. Well, the first question I wanted to ask you guys, obviously a lot of research goes into doing these biographies. And I wanted to hear how your process worked in terms of both visual research and biographical research. And Max, if you look up here, you'll see your, your first up oh, on okay. the... <laughs> yeah, so, um, like, for me, I, uh, when I discovered Luigi, I was really fascinated by his work and his picture. So for those who don't know who he is, he's a photographer, street photographer from the 40s, and he was working for um, the press. And he was, he's well known for pictures of dead bodies. He was like uh, going on crime scenes and taking pictures and it was making the like the first page of the newspaper the next day. And um, he's pretty fascinating because he was um, like, he's the first uh, freelance photographer for, for the press and he was uh, really um, proud of his work. He has a pretty big ego so he was uh, a press photograph, a photograph, but he was also, uh, he wanted to be in museum and he wanted to be considered as an artist and so th that was like something pretty new. And um, he was sleeping in his car, he was just, yeah, he's, he's a guy who's pretty intense. And um, so what I did is that I like looked at tons of his picture, I read everything I could find on him, I watched tons of movies set in those days. And then I tried to write something, but um, weirdly, I think I had too much information. Like, it was really hard for me to separate from what I read. So, like, the um, first draft of the story I did was so factual and boring. It was like really like, oh, it, it did this. And then uh, a few years later, it did this. And it, so I had to take a break from uh, writing the book. Uh, I think I took a break like for a year where I, did, I worked on some other projects. And when I got back to it, like I had all the facts in my head, but it was more blurred, so I could work more properly on the, the story and make something that is a, works as a biography, but it does also work as a story. And you know, it's it's comic, so you want to make a story. You don't want to make something that is just a, a succession of facts. And um, yeah, so I had to have a little bit of freedom with the reality to be able to write something interesting. And uh, yeah, that's mostly how I worked. And I worked with a cartoonist who, uh, so I'm not the one who's drawing this. Uh, it's called, he's called uh, Wouter Manart. And we share a studio and so we would exchange a lot. And while he is drawing, I would comment and he, we, we, yeah, we would really work together. Great, and Jeremy, here's a um, comparison from your book. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just the illustrator uh, because Fabien writes uh, the story. Um, for the documentation, uh, uh, this is Fabien who uh, 
Uh, qui s'en occupe. Um, who, to, who took care of it. Who took care about it. Uh, but um, I have to, to, to look for the landscape, etc. So uh, I have a, a kind of documentation in my head <laughs> um, because I'm hiking a lot in France and uh, I remember how I draw uh, wh wh what I saw. Uh, when I hike, and um, about Audubon, um, we don't have a photography, so um, I have to to look on the internet. So to to this paint, uh, the paint is um, painting of uh, John Sim, if I remember it, um, and I I take uh, maybe uh, one one day to to draw uh, Audubon about uh, this painting. And um, after that, I have to to imagine how it could be uh, in uh, in the life, and uh, I take uh, some um, uh, freedom to 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 draw the the, the characters. Great, uh, Hazel. Okay, so uh, since I've done three biographical comics, I'll talk about the research processes from easiest to hardest. So the easiest one was researching Kathleen Sadat because she's alive and was totally on board with having this mini comic biography done. So me and the woman who wrote this comic, Kristen McCurdy, we got to go over to her house and sit down and interview her. And, um, you know, I got to take photographs on my phone of all her old photos and press clippings and whatnot. So um, that was uh, not that difficult. And you know, also me being from Portland, her being from Portland, it's pretty easy for me to imagine the surrounding scenery and everything. Um, yeah, the Slightly harder, but second easiest was doing the one on Wendy and Lisa because, of course, there's so much stuff out there about prints. So, you know, I read a bunch of prints biographies to try to pinpoint, like, you know, when they joined the band, like different collaborations that they did. Um, you know, I read some joint interviews with them from around the, like, Purple Rain tour and then later interviews that just the two of them did. So there's not a ton of, there. you know, there's not like any biographies of them independently, but um, their collaboration with Prince, which is the period that I covered in If This Be Sin, is pretty well documented. Um, and then definitely the hardest was Gladys Bentley because, you know, she's a Harlem Renaissance blues singer. So just the, there's just a lot less documentation. You know, mostly I found like chapters on her in like different books about Harlem Renaissance artists or, you know, especially books about historical like queer and trans people. Um, so I read some modern stuff and then as much uh, like contemporaneous documentation I could, like news articles about the shows that she was doing and um, an article that she wrote for Ebony Magazine, I think it's called Now I'm a Woman, um, wow. about her like supposedly taking estrogen and you know being all converted to heterosexuality and whatever. Wow. So that's like a an unreliable self-narration of her life, you know, because it seemed like, you know, because it's from her, but she's probably, you know, shaping her story to, um... Can you t could you say when that, when that was written? Um, <laughs> good question. Let me see if I, I, um, I drew a spread from it in mm. here, but I'm not mm. sure, um... I want to say it was in the 50s, which was around the time that she sort of went back into the closet after being, you know, such a publicly, you know, queer and cross-dressing and whatnot figure. Did and you then, find that on the internet? I'm sorry, I'm interviewing you. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, 
Yeah, there were scans of that on the internet on okay. some sort of queer archive site. Um, okay. Oh, actually, I, if anybody's interested, I have a bibliography yeah. of, yeah, there you go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, that take a picture of this. that was definitely <laughs> our, the, the more difficult research process. And um, there's an episode of uh, You Bet Your Life, which is like a game show that she was on that I got to watch. I think that's the only video recording. Is that, that what I've this is her. from here? Um, this on the left, the photo? Yes, exactly. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> what was I going to say about You Bet Your Life? Um, oh, yeah. In the interview, she said that she was writing a biography or an autobiography called If This Be Sin that's about her life, which... Mm. You know, I don't think ever came out. I don't know if it was ever finished, but that's where the title of this collection comes from. Great, Ron. I'm a little bit touched right now. Actually, that's <laughs> that's pretty. Uh, it's moving. Um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> Percy um, Carey was is friends with uh, another an editor at Vertigo. Casey Sejas, and um, I guess that's how the project came about. Um, so we were all in New York, so I kind of like, I just went to his neighborhood to look around to see what it looked like, and I looked at pictures of New York from like, you know, the um, 70s through the 90s, because uh, uh, the book covers New York through that period up until, I guess, the time that the uh, book came out, which I think was like 2012. Um, I guess the type of writing that goes into drawing, I researched just from listening to the music. I was familiar with his music uh, via another musician that he collaborated with that I was a really big fan of. And like, um, so I was familiar with Percy's music. Um, and I just kind of went from there. I did some similar things in regard to uh, uh, taking liberty um, with storytelling but you know this is written by the person who lived it so I didn't really have to you know I check in with him you know if I <laughs> if I was curious I could just check in with him um, and all of the people in there uh, yeah there were witnesses if they're not alive there were witnesses of the things that happened so it wasn't it wasn't too difficult to put all that together aesthetically I was still trying to like I was finding I'm still finding myself like so um uh, working out the process of adaptation is, uh, I'm always evolving on it. At this point, I hadn't even thought about a lot of the sort of the nuanced ways of like what I'm going to say in telling a story that actually happened that belongs to someone else. So I just, that's it, really, yeah. Yeah, you talk about taking liberties. I, I'm curious, all of you guys, um, do you consider your books fiction or non-fiction? Uh, me, I always say it's a fictionalized true story. Like, <laughs> It's a biography, but it's also like I took tons of information and I put them into one book and I didn't want to, I didn't want the book to feel like it's covering a long period of time. So when you read the, 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 the graphic novel, it seems like it's like a few weeks of his life. Uh, but actually, it's of course things that happens like on a, a longer period. But I feel like to make it work as a story, it had to be had to cheat a little bit. And um, and I think like for me, it, um, I took um, like I, I wrote about him, but I wanted to I want like my purpose as a cartoonist is to make stories and not to make. Uh, uh, history book, so I made I made a story, and if people are interested in his work, they can always go check whatever they want. And also with Ouija, there's a strange thing because he wrote an autobiography, but he, like I said before, he has a pretty big ego, so he's just like lying all the time. It's full, of, <laughs> it's full of BS, and so it's it's really hard. You're reading something that he said, and then you read something that somebody else said, and it's completely different. So. Sometimes I had to choose like, like 
I'm gonna take this, and there's like multiple version of the same story, so it's just like, oh, I'm gonna take this one, this one is funnier, and so, yeah. Even the facts are not actual facts. It's a <laughs> philosophical question yeah. that you're asking. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I mean, it kind of calls, um, you know, if you push it far enough, then we have to address uh, the way we look at history, right? And um, recorded history which, you know, um, you have to be aware of the subjective uh, aspect of how history is recorded. So, I mean, these are stories, though. So, I mean, I don't know, in the end, you know, I don't know if it's fiction. What would you say? I mean, if it's somebody uh, talking about their own life, yeah. then I guess... It's it's nonfiction, yeah. but you'd have to ask him, I guess, yeah. how how many, you know, because I mean, even doing autobiography, I take quite a bit of liberties with it. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think this one is pretty straightforwardly nonfiction because it's um, essentially mostly quotes from her from the interview that we did, and um, just like factual captions about, you know, what she was doing with her activism at various times in her life. But um, if this be seen as, like, pretty loose adaptations where um, I think making up dialogue mm. was the, the hardest for me. And, you know, I tried to take, you know, in some cases, like, take things that people said in interviews and recontextualize them sort of into scenes, hmm. you know, but then also try to maybe extrapolate like a personality and a voice from what I was reading. And then, but, you know, most of, I don't know, 95% of the dialogue, I don't know that this person definitely said this at this time. And, um, I think it would, I think it would read less cinematically if I hadn't um, woven it together in that way. Like this one doesn't really use captions or anything. You just follow the story. Yeah, yeah I think I think Ron is right. Also, the saying that even if it's like true, like a true story, it's our our point of view of the the, the story. So it's it's how we see it. So mm. it's it's not like it's I don't know. It's always hard to say like. This is the facts. It's not the facts. It's how we interpreted the facts and the things that we read or heard or interviewed. And it's our view of like all those things we gathered and what we did with it. Made into a narrative. Yeah. yeah. Because it, like if you would do the book on Ouija, maybe it would be completely different. Mm. And you know, like it's with the same facts that I, yeah. that I have. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's how you what you do with the material. And even if the material is true, it's well. But to, to be to be easier, we're going to say everything is true in every book. <laughs> <laughs> we should buy them. Jeremy, your book on the back cover described it as a creative reimagining of Audubon's life. Yeah. Uh, and here's a here's just a, a drawing from the book. Obviously, not yeah. a photograph. So <laughs> for sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about how you approached Audubon's life? Uh, how you? How, how, how I? Yes. Uh, um, um, like um, Max said before, uh, we 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 make uh, comics, so we have to um, enjoy the the readers. So we don't want to to bother them uh, with a biography, uh, uh, born and deaf, uh, just a line. And so. Um, we have to to create uh, something uh, uh, enjoyable, and uh, we have to imagine uh, what uh, his life can uh, uh, will be. Uh, no, sorry. Qu'est-ce que sa vie aurait pu être? Yeah, how how his yeah. Uh, everybody uh, understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we take uh, freedom to. To create some sequence and uh, uh, about uh, what his life can be in the, in the nature or the the part uh, with uh, his family. 
So I think the, the readers can can uh, read uh, the biography of Audubon on the internet uh, if he wants to know about uh, him. But uh, for comics or anything, you you have to to have a, a, a great read or uh, a great moment to read. So that's it. <laughs> Ron, I wanted to ask you a question because your uh, your book is a little bit different in that you adapted Percy's autobiography. Mm. Mm. Can you talk about how you worked together with him and maybe some oh. examples of his involvement in the project? Well, he doesn't have an autobiography that exists uh, before. Like this is it, you know. So it wasn't even a matter of adaptation. It was like working from a script that I have from he and Casey as the editor at Vertigo, and it was this. I think it's. I don't know if he's written any comics since, so um, it was a unique sort of collaboration. Um, what were you gonna? What, what about that? I'm just that curious, what specific? like what involvement he had and in how you guys collaborated. Mm. Well, it's funny because like I never talked to him directly about the script making process, but I would, you know, I went and I hung out with him on the Upper West Side where he grew up, and like we had plenty of conversations about it, so. I'm sure like there's the material that's in the script and then there's like the material that comes from just like talking to him about what happened to him. Um, that was the process. I, I essentially get the script from Casey and then I, I hung out with Percy and if I had questions, I asked him questions about things specifically. Sometimes he would, um, you know, there's sensitive material in it. Like there's violence. Um, Percy has... Uh, a, a child so like um, there were some parts where like in the description uh, the difference between like uh, writing something down and then seeing uh, illustration of it explicitly um, occurred to him that like mm, maybe I don't want to put that in there you know like uh, even though it's still very violent but more in terms of the violence that uh, happened to him he was shot I think 11 times so um, uh, and that, that's how he was paralyzed so, and that's the story of him, kind of. So, did the changes that you made or the way that it came out based on your conversations, mm. were some of those changes in, like, the dialogue and mm. paneling and whatnot, or was it all how things were visually? I was, it was, it was, um, it's visual. Like, uh, I don't think anything, I was, this was, like, my first graphic novel, so I was very careful to, like, be very truthful to like what was written down you know um now i might be like well okay that works in writing but like i'm not gonna put that there or like i'm gonna pull this out and like you know work with the editor to be like okay um this can just be pictures or like maybe there should be some language here um that's to, if that answers okay the so he made certain decisions to yeah. edit it based yeah. on seeing things yeah yeah um we have like you mentioned something that was very interesting like working with the quotes I don't know, like all of this is recalled by the person it happened to, and like that also speaks to kind of like what is the truth uh, in relation to what happened, particularly because like some of the things that happen in this book are um, like the court of law would decide what it was, and it wouldn't necessarily be like what the you know, like it. I, it's just a great question that I think I'm gonna keep thinking about, fact or fiction. Uh, Max, this is a panel from Ouija that really struck me. Um, because you wrote about a, because you wrote about a photographer, there was a heavy influence of photographs in the book. I wondered if you could just talk about incorporating photographs into these graphic biographies and how you guys approach that. Um, yeah. So, um, so Walter had to draw the story uh, from like. He lives in Brussels, he's not in New York, um, and he doesn't live in the 40s, so we had to like search a lot of material, but there's tons of pictures of New York at that time. It's like, it's very rich, there's, there's film, there's tons of things you can look up. And um, what we didn't want to do is, because it's uh, uh, about a photographer, we, don't, we didn't want to have like, exactly the, his photographs in the book. We don't want uh, Wodo to just be looking at pictures and just copying them because we thought it would be 
not very useful if like if people want to see the picture they can just look at the pictures so what we try to do is um, mostly show how he would work and where he would work and like how everything would happen but not the actual pictures and when we did show like when when water had to use a like, I don't know, I, we talk about a specific picture and so he had to use that picture. He would try to change the angle of view to show like what was happening be behind at the same time. And so, yeah, we were always trying to take a step back from his picture and, and try to add something to, to, uh, to make it more understand and, uh, understandable to the reader. And, um, and yeah, but there's, there's so many there's so many documentation on that time period and on, on New York especially so for him it wasn't too hard to uh, to dive into it and he's a really he's really excited about lo <laughs> looking up things on the internet so I had like I created a Tumblr with tons of references yeah. huh. and um, it was just like a a Tumblr you know private thing and he would just go into it and there was like every neighborhood I would talk about, I would put pictures and so and he would just mix everything. And so all the um, yeah, all the, the the things are inspired by photo and mm -hmm. and because he's a photographer he also took picture of his place so we know what his room will, would look like. Like this is where he lives. He lives uh, uh, on the the first floor above the the big gun. So he it's <laughs> which is pretty funny this picture of him taking pictures because he would live across the street from the um, police headquarters in New York and so he would take pictures of uh, criminal going into the uh, police headquarters from his place so he was just like non-stop working. And Jeremy you said you didn't have a lot of photographs to work with. <laughs> um, I have to um, to imagine uh, how it could be at uh, the time um, uh, the story uh, begins at uh, um, the 90th century, so uh, we don't have a lot of uh, photography or documentation, but maybe uh, some, uh, some paint or, or anything else. But um, like I said before, I just uh, uh, took some image pictures on maybe some on movies and uh, with my hike um, and uh, sometimes uh, Fabien uh, gave me some uh, pictures on the, on the storyboard uh, who he wants uh, to be uh, on the place and so um, um, I have uh, to um, j'ai dû un peu uh, uh, improvise mm -hmm. sometimes uh, and it's I have to say, just as an aside, I grew up in Missouri, so, and on the river, a lot of your fo your drawings felt very authentic to me. Okay, <laughs> so I was impressed. <laughs> uh, Hazel, Ron, did you guys work extensively with photos? I know I showed a couple mm. of examples at the beginning, that, but I'm curious how integral that was to your processes. I don't know, just the regular amount. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. found everything that I could on all these people and tried to, you know copy their outfits and stuff mm. um yeah I don't I, I I don't think I worked with photos in a particularly unique way but it's certainly crucial to figure out what people even looked like mm -hmm. yeah it was yeah definitely um not like as far from like one to one it's like I look at a picture of okay I know these MCs or I know this location um in the case of Many of the locations um, in New York, like I got to just go and I could walk up and kind of see what the space felt like. And then I try to find like um, examples of the time period. And then I try to put something together cohesive because like, you know, I didn't have a lot of examples of exactly what things were. So sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, typical illustrator stuff. <laughs> Here, getting back to, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back and forth. I had these slides a little out of order, as as I can see now. A little fun, but here are two. Thing going yeah, here are two <laughs> examples of 
dream sequences, Jeremy and Max, that you had in your books. Um, how, how do you approach when you're doing, a, like how do you, uh, I guess the question is, in terms of factual accuracy, how do you justify and, and create dream sequences in a biography? Um, so for me, uh, like I said before, uh, Ouija was sh uh, shooting a lot of crime scene. And he's talking about it like he's not affected at all. Like he's just like, ha ha, the guy is dead. Oh, I'm moving his arm, blah, blah, blah. He's just like really bragging about it. And he, but he spent almost like 10 years of his life working at night on crime scenes and murders, uh, you know, a, a burn building. So it's just like, I cannot believe that it wouldn't affect him. So. Um, I use the dr the dream sequence to show how disturbed he is by all that. Even if when he's uh, like talking with the cops and talking with people, he's just like being his big full self, being like, "Oh, I'm so I'm so good. I'm such a good photographer." <laughs> but yeah, I wanted him to feel more human, and I think even if you see dead body every day, it still affects you somehow. And that's why I use the the dream sequence. And this sequence uh, is right by uh, Fabien. And the idea of uh, the, the changing head of Audubon is uh, from his wife. <laughs> and uh, Fabien knew uh, that uh, Audubon's uh, going to die, for sure. <laughs> Everybody is dying. So. Um, um, and uh, his wife said, uh, he, uh, Fabien has the idea uh, uh, to the changing of his head of uh, Audubon in Eagle, because uh, Eagle is uh, um, um, the, le, le, is a symbol of America. So this is obvious for a French to America who uh, has a um, naturalized American. Uh, so um, just uh, his wife said, "Why don't you put uh, the 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 head of the eagle on the head of uh, the transformation? Because after that, after that, um, Audubon uh, uh, fly into the window and uh, become a, a real eagle and uh, go on the big trip. Uh, I don't want to spoil you, <laughs> <laughs> so." Well, uh, it's so, an amazing sequence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, most of the idea uh, uh, of the dream of is there is another sequence uh, of a dream in the in the book. Uh, this is, I think, for um, the. Pour, um, oh, c est, c est complicated. It's complicated to say. <laughs> um, pour, um, uh, I I don't, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know even in French, so whatever. <laughs> um, no, that's it. Yeah. I gotta say, this dream sequence idea is so smart as a way to take a little bit of liberty with like trying to express what your perception is of the emotional arc of the story, and it's like you can't say it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dream sequence in sentences where he kind of remembers, or he he um, <clears throat> he po he thinks about what would have happened if he had never, I think, what had happened to him, like if he had never been shot on the way to like this big uh, open mic night or MC battle, and um, it's you know it's a recall, it's not necessarily maybe it's like a waking dream type of thing. He's just fantasizing, and it was an interesting way of like. Um, you know, because the, you know, he lost his ability to walk, and he lost, you know, like um, it radically changed his life. So it was interesting to kind of, you know, for him as a sort of like fan fantasy that could get played out visually in a way that um, he, you know, he didn't necessarily have the, you know, I guess he doesn't draw. I'm sure he could draw something, um, and I drew it in pencil because it was like. Uh, it was like thinking about the materials that I was using, um, like to ink something would be like to complete it for, like to complete the production. 
So like I wanted it to reflect that um, for him it was like they were plans and they were things that like exist maybe like in another timeline but he never got to complete them. So I just, instead of doing like, a, you know, I don't know, wavy lines around it or something. <laughs> I kind of, I just, I left it in pencil and I think that's how he printed it. I don't know. I don't even have a copy anymore. So like, <laughs> like yeah. maybe I do somewhere. Well, I want to make sure that I ask you guys this question. Um, in preparing for today, I read a lot of interviews with biographers about mm -hmm. what motivated them. And one of the things that really stood out is um, that biographers tend to be drawn to their subjects because of some personal connection or motive. So what was your connection to your subjects? Um, Ron, you want to start? Uh, this is, um, like if I'm going to be completely honest, it's like it's my job, you know? Like I, I it's not like uh, I have, you know, I'm, you know, I read a good deal of history, and there are works that I, there are subjects that I do want to um, uh, work, create biographies for. Um, but this wasn't, sentences was not a case. Black history, in its own words, and that's nothing against, you know, Percy. Like, I, there are elements of Percy's story that um, resonate with uh, my my life, family life, you know, but I never would have thought to have done that. Like I, you know, um, so that was a different, you know, it's a different way of coming at it. Black history in its own words uh, is something different. It's essentially just the, the figures that I found like uh, inspiring and figure a lot of them that I just felt like, you know, well, I want people to be as excited about them as I am. So, uh, and to realize the breadth of experience and expression, you know. Yeah, Hazel, I have, you can certainly talk about Gladys Bentley, but I, I do have a couple panels from the Kathleen Sadat. Bye. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to start with Gladys Bentley because I think I was tapped for this Kathleen Sadat thing because of having done if this be sin. So um, yeah, the origin, the origin of that was actually I was in school and there is a theme for the project of the year, which was kings and queens. And you know, I was like, okay, I want to do something about a drag king because you know I was already very interested in like, you know, different kinds of like gender bending and trans masculine stuff. And uh, so you know, I just looked into it and saw that a lot of people had been inspired in, you know, their acts by Gladys Bentley. And I just, yeah, it's just really powerful. Like that whole like period and scene seemed like, you know, very open to and expressive of queerness, but, you know, partly because it was these performers. So people could sort of come and like, I think there was an extent of like people, you know, coming and gawking like, oh, isn't this weird? But, you know, I just really, it's just such an emotional story, especially with her, you know, having to, you know, hang up her top hat in the end because of just, you know, with McCarthyism, like the whole era getting more um, conservative. And then um, with Wendy and Lisa, part of the reason that I was drawn to that was because I knew that I was doing this collection and, you know, Gladys's story ends on a sad note vis-a-vis -vis queerness and kind of so does the other story in the book, which is fiction. So I was like, let me do something about um, a couple at least and, you know, a couple who like went through these creative, you know, trials and tribulations, but, you know, came out of it really strong and, you know, went on to do their own um, collaborations and everything. And, you know, so I was trying to find sort of something that would be a counterpoint to um, these other pieces that would be a little bit more 
uplifting, you know, even though there's sad elements of, um, you know, Prince kind of trying to erase their creative contributions, it seemed like. Um, and, you know, I'm just a fan of all the music that they were <laughs> making together, so it, it was really enjoyable to get to immerse myself in that. And just out of curiosity, of Kathleen? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, having done and published these other two comics, I think the Comics for Change people thought of me because they were doing this whole box set on Oregon activists, you know, and so they um, were willing to pair me up with Kathleen because, you know, I'm from Portland and also out of the people that she wanted to do, or that they wanted to do, I think Kathleen was the one who was the gay rights activist and the AIDS rights activist and, you know, so it um, definitely meshed with my interests. Great. Max? Um, yeah, for, whoops, for me, um, I discovered Ouija kind of randomly while I was doing a a 24-hour comic with a friend and uh, we needed documentation and we just grabbed random book at the library and one of them was uh, Naked City, the book from Ouija yeah. and I was really attracted by the pictures and really fascinated by it. It's kind of, uh, it's pretty morbid because it's, uh, it's uh, there's a lot of dead people but at the same time there's also something um, He's always including everybody that is watching this crime scene, so there's kind of a voyeur feel to it. And um, weirdly, it's also, um, I don't know, I feel like maybe I'm seeing too much in those pictures, but for me, when I look at those pictures, I feel like uh, he would, like he really loved that neighborhood and he was really in love with the people there, so there's a, strange feeling of something that is really violent and, and harsh and at the same time it's very comfy. I don't know, there's something weird about it. And when I discovered him, I suddenly ran into him all the time. Like I would like I would walk in the street and there's, oh, there's a big exhibition about Ouija, so oh, I'm going to go to him. And somebody would give me a book and it was like, oh, it's a book on Ouija. And it's just like yeah. random thing where I would just always, yeah, run into him and I read his autobiography and I was even more fascinated by the guy and um, weirdly I think I, w um, I was fascinated by him because he's like completely the opposite of me. He's somebody like he uh, has a big ego, he's just bragging all the time, he's a hustler, he's a, I don't know, there's something like I kind of, uh, he's kind of an asshole, but <laughs> the kind of asshole that you like. So this. I don't know, there's something very strange about him. So I feel like if, if it's something, if it was somebody I knew, it would be that, that very good friend that you love, but you never want to see him. Like you never want to have him at your place. Like you want to just see him in the street and be happy to see him, but you don't want him to. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I don't know. There was a kind of a love and hate feeling about him. And, um, and yeah, so that's why I started working on it. And um, yeah, it's the only time I did a, a biography, so maybe I'll do another sometime. But I never ran into something that was so that that took me so much. Jeremy, um, I did a new uh, Audubon before the book. Um, at the time uh, with Fabien, we were we looking for a, for a story for to write, and uh, Fabien gave me some some personality like Darwin, Robert Louis Stevenson. So I said, no. Uh, but <laughs> and uh, one time I heard uh, um, a reportage, a documentary on Audubon on the radio. And I look uh, at uh, Wikipedia uh, of the biography of Audubon uh, and uh, I was uh, impressive of uh, the short uh, biography, but uh, very um, uh, impressive about uh, his travel or what we what he he, he done, and uh, I saw the the paint on the internet and I I, I was uh, astonished. <laughs> so 
I said to Fabien, uh, why uh, we don't uh, do uh, a story about Audubon? And uh, Fabien said yes, because he knew him. Uh, because Fabien uh, lived in uh, uh, Nantes, in France, and uh, Audubon grew up uh, near Nantes, so there is a swamp, Audubon, uh, near Nantes. So uh, Fabien knew the swamp, so. <laughs> so <enough>. yes, <laughs> yeah. So yes, no, he knew him. So, and um, I, I learned about Audubon uh, while I made the book, and uh, I was uh, really fascinating about his life and uh, what he's done. Um, and a French in the USA, uh, uh, he was a particular because uh, he was a great talker. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, he has a big mouth. <laughs> he, sometimes he lies about uh, his life to impress uh, people to, to some parties. So uh, um, that was funny. So <laughs> and um, during the book, um, I'm, I think about uh, Audubon was a a real, real um, I've, personality. I don't know how to say because I, I, I think uh, people can be uh, um, awesome. Uh, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, um, but, uh, peut un peut-être un peu particulier. Enfin, que, quelqu'un qui ressort de tout. Enfin, he, he was odd. He was uh, he's a little eccentric. Eccentric, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. but um, sometimes you have some uh, personality who was uh, different from others and a uh, great, great personality. I, I don't know, if I think about Darwin uh, or other people, so uh, um, maybe I love him, <laughs> <laughs> but um, and I like the the way we think about the nature and etc. So I took his place, uh, uh, no, not this place, I took, uh, je me suis mis à sa place. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I took his place uh, in the nature while uh, he going to the woods and uh, saw the birds or draw the birds. Uh, so. Uh, I like him. I love. I love him. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned Darwin. That's a good segue. I, all of the biographies we've been talking about are older works for you guys, and I wanted to just give you a chance at the end here to talk mm. about your most current works. So mm. I have a few slides. Um, Max, these are your new books. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah. Um, so I have a new book that's just coming out for the show now. It's called Bastard. Is the and um, it's um. A mom and a boy who are on the run from a heist, and so it's a lot, there's a lot of action in the book. But it's mostly about the relationship between that mom and her kid, and why would a mom uh, go uh, rob a bank with a kid? So it's, it's how how they work together, how what what their relation is, and. Um, on the other side, it's a book called Stigetil, who's uh, in, in French, but it's going to be in English in 2020. It's more of a YA comics. And I have a, yeah, I'll have a, another YA comics coming out in June with Conundrum Press called Simon and Louise. And I also, I have tons of things. I also have a, a book coming out in February with uh, Fanta Graphics called Hobo Mom, um, on a mom who's a hobo. And it's, uh, it's a book I did with um, Charles Fosman, who's um, pretty well known now because of the Netflix show, uh, The End of the Fucking World. And um, so it's a book that we did together. We both wrote and drew together in every panel. So I live in Brussels and he lived in the US, so we were working digitally, but we were erasing and redrawing each other's panel and changing the text of each other. And so the book is really a mix of both our style of narration and drawing. And yeah, today I, when I look at it, I have no idea what I did in the book and what he did. It's really a complete mix of both our work. Great. 
Ron, this is your new book. Oh, yeah. Um, it's newspaper. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I did a newspaper about um, comics and pop culture, a uh, kind of critical look at the medium. And the first is um, deals directly with uh, sort of racial racial aesthetics um and yeah it's a bunch of <laughs> it's a bunch of questions about the use of aesthetics in pop culture and the first issue particularly particularly deals with black culture um and yeah and formal processes and you know it's it's some inside ball but also, some uh, comics criticism. Some of the some of my favorite works that came out recently, and how they dealt with uh, the aesthetics of race. Uh, you may have seen. I don't know if you're um, if you're uh, from um, if you're from here. You may have seen like a couple days ago. Like I was asked to talk about the use of aesthetics in regard to race. Yeah, on TV and CNN. Um, this newspaper covers a lot of the stuff that I mentioned briefly. Uh, and that silly television show. Um, I'm also, uh, yeah, I'm also, yeah, that's, that's all you need to know about for now. <laughs> Hazel, here are your books. Okay, so um, now I'm working on a lot of autobio memoir stuff. Kind of the theme here is I've done biographical and autobiographical because I'm just like, not creative enough to come up with something from whole cloth. Like, it's always based on somebody's life. So, um, yeah, these are two that came out last SPX. Sugartown is, um, yeah, speaking of fictionalizing life and a loose adaptation, it's a pretty loose adaptation with, you know, a relation to the facts. It's a queer poly rom-com, so, you know, I you know, did some things to make it more of a fun read. And um, I edit anthologies. Also, Comics for Choice is actually not one that um, I have any of my own work in, but it is mostly autobio and nonfiction comics about abortion. It's got, of course, a lot of people's personal experiences, but then also comics by activists, um, medical providers, clinic escorts, historians, all kinds of people. So it, um, yeah, it's almost all nonfiction, but it just sort of hits the issue of like abortion access and, you know, d people's different experiences from every angle. And it's also nominated for an Ignatz for Outstanding Anthology, by the way. Congratulations. <laughs> and Jeremy. Um, uh, this is about uh, Darwin, so <laughs> he's out uh, since uh, three weeks in France, and uh, ça sortira. It go out uh, uh, in April uh, in English, but I don't know. I have to ask to no bro if it's in UK in April or in US in April. I don't. I don't. <laughs> so. <laughs> So um, uh, this is about Darwin, and now I made a book, an adaptation of a, a book, a young book, a uh, book, a roman jeunesse, uh, a young adult book, young adult book, novel. Oh, novel. <laughs> so um, I'm, I have to do this for one year and after maybe we we close a kind of trilogy on the, the traveler uh, and the third book is about uh, Robert Louis Stevenson so mm. <laughs> oh, cool. uh, at the start when we we are thinking about uh, what we can do with Fabien and he said to me, uh, Darwin, Robert Louis Stevenson, and I said no. <laughs> and then now, yeah, I, <laughs> I was afraid, so. okay. We have time for like one question, or are we at the, we're done? We're done? Okay, here is uh, some signing schedule. Sorry, Ron, you're not on the list, but you can quickly plug when you're gonna be signing. Oh, that's what I was looking, because I was like, is it happening right now? Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, hold on, give me a second. Yeah, it's at the, um, 
the B, you guys go first, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go next. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we got to wrap up. They're, oh, they're clearing out the room, but <laughs> okay, just right. take um, a quick mental note. Uh, yeah, you I'm going to be at the down. Beehive table. It's W. It's, like, way out in the cut. I'll be signing the newspaper. Maybe, like, right now I'll be <laughs> heading over there. Um, if you're interested, follow me there, I guess. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panelists.